So what's your resolution? And it's okay to have more than one, but you don't want to do a shotgun approach. You want to take a rifle approach. Focus on something and go after it. But here's what I know about resolutions. Most people make them, but only 8% of the people actually keep them. And you know how long it takes before they break them? Before the resolutions fall apart and go away? 12 days. Now I'm going to talk about how to actually make those resolutions come true. In the American Indian culture, there's an old saying attributed to them that says, you cannot leave a footprint in a moving stream. Think about that. You cannot leave a footprint in a moving stream. Why? Because everything gets washed away. Unless you make a really big splash, unless you make a really big impact. You don't have to be in a big position. You don't have to be the president or a senator or invent the smartphone or come up with a cure for cancer. You can have an impact in your own life. That's why you've heard me say many times, I want you to star in your own life. Now, you may be thinking, geez, lighten up. We're just talking about New Year's resolutions. I've already said that. If a New Year's resolution is just something you kind of you know, laugh about over eggnog and you yuck it up and say, yeah, I'm going to do A, B, and C. Fine, that, that's okay. Then none of this matters to you. But if you're one of those who says, you know what, just one time a year that I really stop and think about if I do want to make some changes in my life and it just happens to be on New Year's, it could be on July 17th, I don't care. But when you do stop to think about that and say you want to make a change, I just want you to think about this. You're the only you in the history of the world. And I guess with that, I think, comes some responsibility to be the best you that you can be. So if you're not really interested in making change, then you don't need to listen to this right now. Come back to it sometime when you do want to make the change or tell somebody that does want to make a change to listen to it. But if you want to be a better you, then you do want to listen to this. And I can tell you right now, a simple test to determine whether you're ready for change or not, because there are four stages for readiness and change. Four stages for readiness with regard to change. Stage number one is when you're doing it because some authority makes you do it. You get in a fight and you get arrested for disturbing the peace. So you go to court and the court says, well, I'm going to order you into a 12-week anger management program. And you're rolling your eyes and, oh, yeah, fine, beats paying a fine, so okay, I'll go. What's the chance that somebody in that circumstance is going to really improve their temper? Probably not very good. They're not motivated. They don't want to be there. They can go in there and sit there and cross their arms, lean back in their chair for their hour, 12 weeks in a row. They fill the square, check the box, they're out of there. They're not motivated to learn. They're not a sponge soaking up information. They're just there because they were ordered to be. Okay, that's stage number one. Stage number two is when you're doing it to please someone else. It's like your spouse wants you to do something. They want you to get more exercise, or they want you to lose weight, or they want you to be less harsh with your family members or something, and so you agree to it. But you're doing it just to make them happy. You don't really think you have a problem but you agree to it just to make them happy to get them off of your back. So again, motivation is missing. You're just doing it to please somebody else. Stage three is when your heart's not in it, but at least intellectually, you know that you need to do it. You don't want to do it, but at least intellectually, you know that you need to do it. There's a big difference between wanting to do it and knowing that you need to do it. Maybe you want to want to, but you don't want to. You wish you did. You wish your heart was in it, and in your head, you know, yeah, it'd probably be better if I did this differently, but I'm just not right now. That's just not on my list of things to do. So in your head, you know it, but in your heart, you're just not really into it. And then there's stage four. Nobody makes lasting change until they're in stage four. Stage four is when you are ready mentally and emotionally to make a change. You are motivated at a heart level to make a change. 
That's when you look in a mirror and say, I'm not taking this from myself for another day, for another hour, for another minute will I accept this for myself. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how scary it is on the other side of the wall. I'm going through the wall. I am so sick of this. I am so sick of myself. I'm so sick of my excuses. I'm so sick of my reality. I don't care what the risks are. I'm making this change. That's when people make changes. That's when people get off of drugs. That's when people lose weight. That's when people change jobs. That's when people stop venting their temper. That's when people get an education instead of continuing in a dead-end job they don't like. That's when people make whatever change it is in stage four of readiness. And you got to ask yourself, am I really ready? Is this a priority to me? Do I approach this with urgency? Am I so sick to death of this? I was talking to a woman not too long ago that said she really, really wanted to lose weight. And I said, yeah, how many diets have you been on in your life? And she said, probably 50. She said, I probably lost 500 pounds, 10 pounds, 50 times. I said, so what's different this time? She said, I am sick to death of it. I'm sick of walking in the room and tugging on my jacket, pulling it down around my hips, pulling it down in the back, pulling it closed in the front. I'm sick to death of walking in a room and trying to get my back against the wall so nobody's looking at me from behind. I'm tired of bending over to try to tie a running shoe, and I'm out of breath because my stomach is pushing up into my lungs and I can't even breathe. I'm sick to death of it. And I said to myself and to her, number 51 just might be your time. You might finally be in stage four. And I ask her, why should you get to lose weight and somebody else not? She said, I've suffered long enough. I deserve this. I've worked hard and I've failed. I've been criticized. I've hurt. I deserve this. And by God, I'm claiming it. Now, you guys have probably heard me talk about personal truth before. Personal truth is important because... What you believe about yourself determines what kind of results you generate in your life. We generate the results in life that we believe we deserve. If we believe that great results, a good job, a healthy body, an athletic figure and build, well-adjusted children, a peaceful marriage, if we believe all of those things are great, but they're for other people, not for me, then you won't have those things. If you believe I'm damaged because I grew up in a chaotic, violent home, and so I'm therefore second class, I'm damaged goods, then you will create that result in your life. You will perpetuate that in your generation because it's what you think you deserve. You generate the results in life you believe you deserve. So You look and you say, what's my background? Who am I? How am I different from other people? And based on that comparison and that judgment you put on yourself, you will generate second-class results because you secretly believe those top-notch results are for other people. Now, you may say different. You say it to other people because you wear a social mask. But if inside you truly believe, yeah, I can talk about it and I can put on an act, But in my quietest moments when I'm alone, I really believe those results are for other people. They're not for me. Then you won't have them. Now, if that's true, how do you change that? Well, if you've got a damaged personal truth, then you have to heal that personal truth. You have to forgive yourself. You have to heal open wounds. And then this is very important. You have to behave your way to success. Now, some people would say, well, Dr. Phil, that's just a fancy way of saying fake it till you make it. No, it's not, because each behavior you make is authentic. You have to behave your way to success. If you want to be confident, then you need to behave with confidence. You need to act in a confident manner. And you say, well, I'm not really feeling confident, so you're telling me to just act like I am. Well, no, I'm telling you to behave as confident people behave. You say, well, so you're saying fake it. No, I'm saying 
adapt the behaviors that confident people have. Now, why is that important? Because we make attributions to ourselves about ourselves based on what we observe ourselves do. If we observe ourselves walk into a situation that ordinarily we would be timid and shy and mousy and nervous, but we observe ourselves walk into that situation with our shoulders back, our head held high, and we look people in the eye, shake their hands and say, hello, good to meet you. I'm glad to be here. That's what a confident person would do, right? They belong there. They believe they belong there. So they act like they belong there. They look people in the eye. They shake their hands. They they engage them. They don't apologize for being there. They walk up and say, hello, my name's so-and-so. What's your name? Hi. That's what they do. That's what confident people do. You behave your way to success. You're behaving as confident people behave. So you observe yourself doing that. And then you say, wow, I saw myself do that. So I now see that I can do that. I can be confident in those situations. I have two grandchildren, Avery and London, and they're in lower school. It's interesting that at this school, one of the rules they have is, first off, a teacher or a teacher's aide meets the car every morning when their parents drop them off. They come and open the door, and they say, good morning, Avery, how are you? She cannot look at her shoes and kind of shrink away. She has to say, fine, Mrs. Johnson, how are you? They teach them from very early on how to engage people. They make eye contact. They call them by name. They make an appropriate greeting. And then I've watched these children. They've been there, one for now four years, the other for two. I've watched these children when I introduce them to adults in my life. They step up and say, hi, I'm Avery. Hi, I'm London. They've learned to behave in a confident manner. So they've observed themselves do that, and they're confident in meeting people. They behave confidently. They've observed themselves behave confidently. So they are confident. You need to understand that you can behave your way to success. And you don't need to go to a year of therapy to do this. Just listen to what I'm telling you and do it. Save yourself a year of therapy and spend that on wardrobe or a trip. Look, half the solution to any problem lies in properly defining it. And you have to know what you want, or you'll never get it. You have to name it to claim it. You have to name it to claim it. you got to know what it is you want in order to recognize it when you get it. Remember I said to you earlier that if I was in bed and the phone rang and somebody said, hey, listen, I'm lost. Can you tell me how to get to first to now? What would my first question be? Where are you? Right? Because I'm going to give a different set of directions. If they're east of First and Elm versus west of First and Elm, north of First and Elm, south of First and Elm, I need to know where you are before I can tell you how to get where you want to go. The same thing is true with you. If you're going to make these New Year's resolutions, the first thing you need to do regarding the dimension you want to change in is ask the question, where am I with regard to this? If I want to have a better spiritual life, if I want to have a better job, if I want to be healthier, if I want to make more money, if I want to get along better with my in-laws, whatever, you have to first assess where you are. And you can do that by asking yourself the following questions. First, why is this behavior change-worthy? The behavior resolving to change. Your resolution. Why is it change-worthy? Why does it deserve to be on your list? Certainly, why does it deserve to be on the top of your list? Why? Is it creating pain, distance, unhealthiness? What is it creating? Question two, what pain is this creating in your life or somebody's life that you want it to stop? Then three, what is blocking you from having what you want? Is it something within? Is it a damaged personal truth? Is it lack of access? Is it physical limitations? What is it? What's blocking you? Question four is really part of question three, so it could be 3B. I'll just call it four. If there's something blocking you, who or what needs to be removed from the equation? If you want to have a close relationship with your mother, but since you got married, you can't because your spouse just is threatened by it. Well, that's blocking you from having a healthy relationship with your mother. That's not reasonable. 
So you've got to remove that obstacle. So your spouse is going to have to get their ducks in a row and get secure enough for you to have a relationship with your own mother, or they may need to leave the equation. But if you really want this, if it's urgent enough that it went on your list, you need to say who or what needs to be removed from the path in order for me to get what I want. And then the last question you need to ask yourself, and this is really, really important, how will I feel if I have it? If you achieve your resolution, how are you going to feel if you have it? This is important because you need to make sure you're wanting the right thing. Ask yourself, if I achieve my resolution, if I get what it is that I'm saying I want, How am I going to feel? Am I going to feel relief? Am I going to be proud? Am I going to be excited, satisfied? And if the answer is, wow, I don't know. I'm not sure that's going to give me what I'm looking for. Then maybe you need to revise your goal. Make sure that what you want is going to get you what you think it's going to get you. For example, I've talked to people that said, I just have a terrible self-image, and so I want to get plastic surgery. Well, is plastic surgery going to change your internal dialogue? Eh, Maybe, maybe not. I tend to think we need to deal with psychological problems psychologically, medical problems medically, spiritual problems spiritually, familial problems familially. I think we need to stay in our lane. Can't tell you how many people have had a poor self-image and got plastic surgery and still had a poor self-image. I think that's sad when I see that. So you got to make sure that you're wanting the right thing. And there are two things in life that you are in total control of, and that's your attitude and your effort. Those are two things you always control, your attitude and your effort. So you want to choose a goal that, whether you achieve it or not, is a function of your attitude and your effort. That will make you feel so much better. And I promise you, plastic surgery is not going to fix your self-esteem. Eckhart Tolle said, the primary cause of unhappiness is never the situation, but your thoughts about it. You know, you've heard me say, it's not reality that you respond to, it's what you say to yourself about reality. Eckhart's saying the same thing. Primary cause of unhappiness is never the situation, but your thoughts about it. So let's talk about asking yourself where you are. I'm going to give you five categories. I'm going to put a chart on the website for you, but I'm going to go through it with you real quick here. Life dimensions, personal, relational, professional, familial, and spiritual. Those are five dimensions of your life. If you can think of some others, add them. That's okay. But I'm just breaking it down to these five. Your resolution is probably going to fall into one of those five categories. It's going to be something personal like self-esteem, education, finance, health, Or it's going to be relational. And if it's relational, who are we talking about? Your significant other? Friends? Maybe you want to make new relationships. Maybe you want to repair an existing relationship. Maybe you want to reestablish lost relationships. So you start out broad, and then you start narrowing down. Your greatest test will be how you handle people who mishandled you. Think about that. Your greatest test in life will often be how you handle people who have mishandled you, they've mistreated you, they've been unfair with you. So how are you going to handle them? That will be under the relational area, maybe spouse, friends, an existing relationship that needs repair. Then the third dimension was professional. You want to improve your job performance? You want to open a business or change businesses? You want to set some objectives to achieve? You want to get a promotion? You want to make a career change? Maybe it's time to go out with the old and in with the new. Maybe it's time to go out with the old and in with the true. Maybe it's time to stop lying to yourself. Get rid of old thinking and replace it with honesty. Being honest with yourself. Out with the old, in with the true. Be truthful with yourself. The fourth dimension was familial. So what about your family? Do you want to improve your relationship with your parents, your children, your siblings? Maybe your extended family, your in-laws, who knows? And then spiritual. What is it you want to improve spiritually? Your personal relationship with your higher power? Your spiritual walk, just how you experience day-to-day your spiritual life. Do you want to spend personal study and communion? Do you want to enrich your prayer life? Do you want to change your life focus where it's more spiritual? 
These are the things that you have to ask yourself. Now, I'm going to put this chart on the website so you can refer back to it. I've gone through it now just to kind of stimulate your thinking, but this just kind of helps you locate your life. This is part of the answer to where am I? And look, none of this stuff comes easy. I get that. But if you don't sacrifice for what you want, what you want becomes a sacrifice. Don't sacrifice the things that you really, really want because you're unwilling to make sacrifices to get them. I'm going to give you some questions that go with out with the old and in with the true. These are things you need to ask yourself and be really, really honest about. What characteristics am I carrying with me from one situation to the next? Do I go into situations expecting a negative outcome? Think about that. Do you go in there just thinking, this ain't going to work? Do I go into situations with a chip on my shoulder? Am I so judgmental that I condemn people in situations the moment I arrive? I just, here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. Am I so angry and embittered that I spew ugliness on everyone I engage? Am I so insecure that I look for and find examples of how I am mistreated in every situation? Am I so passive and unwilling to claim my space that I invite people to overlook and disrespect me? Avery and London don't. They're not wallflowers. They walk up to people and say, hello, my name's Avery. Good to meet you. That does not invite people to overlook them. Do I hide insecurity behind the wall of false superiority and arrogance? Now think about that. Don't you know people that do that? They're really insecure but they come across with an air of false superiority and arrogance. But if you ever said boo, they would just fall apart. Do I try so hard that I wear people out with my overreaching? Do I spend all my time comparing myself to other people? Do I cheat myself out of genuinely experiencing situations by worrying the entire time about how people are viewing me? Have I doomed key relationships in my life by judging and condemning myself and others? I'm going to put those on the website also, because I want you to be honest with people about who you are, what you want, and how you expect to be treated. If you engage people with standards, there's just a price of poker to be in your life. If you engage people with standards, you only scare off people that are not meant for you. If you all of a sudden start saying, you're going to have to treat me with dignity and respect, and people are like, oh, well, listen, I was willing for you to stay around until you start making demands. You start expecting me to treat you with dignity and respect. Those people weren't meant for you. You have to always know the difference between what you're getting and what you deserve. Always know the difference between what you're getting and what you deserve. And if there's a big gap there, you need to change out some of the people in your life. So I'm telling you, if you want your New Year's resolution to really be a changing force in your life, make the decision, the life decision that you really do want to change it. Decide you're so sick of your crap, you're not going to take it anymore. Make a plan. Have a strategy. Get excited about it. And then identify the seven-step strategy that you need to get from where you are to where you need to be. And like I said, you got to shake it up to break it up. If you want different, you've got to do different. The most overquoted statement I've ever heard from the world of psychology is that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. It's probably overquoted so much because it applies to so many of us. We just keep doing the same thing over and over and over, and then we're stunned when we don't get different results. So if you want different, do different. Dr. Phil here. Come February 27th, you're going to be able to pick up a book called We've Got Issues, and you know we do. This is a book that says it's going to teach you how to stand strong for America's soul and sanity. And in this book, I set forth 10 principles for saving this society from going off the deep end, 10 principles for protecting your family, 10 principles for giving you what you need to flourish 
and have the life that you want for yourself and for your children and for your grandchildren. We've taken some wrong turns. We've been letting the loudest voices dictate some of the thinking that has taken us way off course. Well, I'm speaking up and bringing us back to the center of the road. I hope you'll pick this book up, and I hope you'll read it with a real open mind because I'm pushing back against a lot of what you've been hearing. Somebody had to do it. Might as well be me. February 27th, we've got issues. I've got two very longtime close friends. These guys are really more family than friends. They're here for a specific reason. Dr. Patrick DeFazio was born and raised in Niagara Falls on the Canadian side, the Ontario side. He completed his pre-med studies at Brock University in Canada and received his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of the State of New York. He graduated with honors in 1988 from Parker University College of Chiropractic in my hometown, Dallas, Texas. He was the founding father, director of athletics, and also served on the Academic Standards Committee. He's a supervising doctor for the University of Health Sciences in Los Angeles. Really is experienced in treating sports injuries, which is one of the things we're going to talk about today. He's got patients in all the professional sports, NFL, NHL, MLB, PGA, and we'll talk about his approach in just a minute. Also with me is my good friend, Dave Fabrizio. He's a physical therapist. His physical therapy and sports medicine career started in the United States Air Force. He graduated cum laude from Cleveland State University with a Bachelor of Science in Physical Therapy. He did internships at the top medical facilities in the Cleveland area, including the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, and he treats all kinds of populations, acute, cardiac, neurological patients, orthopedic, sports medicine as well. He was selected as one of the two physical therapists at the Great Lakes, what was the whole name of that? Great Lakes Regional Rehab Center. Yeah, yeah. up there, and he's qualified to teach biomechanics, ergonomics, and back school. I was really impressed that he's got a thousand hours in athletic training rooms across the country in both college with high school athletics and has a real diverse and in-depth understanding of kinesiology and abnormal movement patterns. So welcome both of you. I'm glad you guys are sitting down with me today. We're at the top of the year and the number one resolution is what? Everybody wants to be healthy, live a healthier life, start exercising. People say that, but then they don't stick with it, or they say it and they overdo it and they injure themselves. And right now, you see people get off the couch, have heart attacks, shovel in snow. Come spring, you see people get off the couch and get into softball leagues. They pull hamstrings, they blow out knees, they do all sort of things like that. Now we've got pickleball, which I'm a big fan. I think pickleball is a great thing, get people active, but they're getting off the couch and They're blowing out shoulders and all sort of things in pickleball. So I thought it was a good time to talk to people about, let's do this right. We want activity. We want to do it right. Dave, why are people getting injured so much? Well, it's funny you mentioned pickleball because I've had so many patients over the last few years. You probably have too. But, you know, they're they're going into this and, and it's such a fun game that everybody, regardless, because there's there's limited movements, so people that are, aren't really great athletes are still able to do it, right? And they love it. But the, but the problem is there has to be a certain level of conditioning going into it so that your, your tendons are able to absorb the force. Like I see a lot of rotator cuff inflammation from people because they're, they're basically, uh, they're going at it like crazy with that ball. There's not much weight to the ball and, and they're straining their shoulders. So I think the key is um, if you're going to, if you're going to try and get into these activities, there's a certain amount of mobility you have to have flexibility and strength and stability. So doing rotator cuff stuff and some scapular stabilization work, stuff like that, so that your shoulders better able to withstand that. Well, you might as well be talking a foreign language because you say those words like everybody knows what that means, but we don't know <laughs> what that means. And which part? Well, your scapular stabilization. So, okay, everybody do your scapular stabilization. Thanks for tuning in. What the all right, hell let me does make, that mean? All right, let me make it more tangible. In general, when I rehab a shoulder, for example, um, most people want to train, particularly the guys, they want to train pecs and they want to train biceps. 
They don't think about anything on the backside of the, the, the body, right? So typically I'll tell people, look, do three back exercises for every one chest exercise you do. So you get better balance. You want that posterior chain strong because your scapulae, right? They have to have all the muscles stabilizing them. Okay, you're talking about your shoulder blades. Talking about your shoulder blades, right? Okay. Yes, your shoulder blades. So, so you want those muscles firing effectively, right? The rotator cuff can be really strong, but if you don't have the stability of those, those like what the scapular what muscles. You, what should people do? For example, rows uh, and rows at different levels, like a high, a high row, a low row. Um, things yeah, we call- and People don't need to join a gym for this. They can get some tubing or something, right? And put it around a doorknob and pull on it. Sports cords are great. Uh, you could totally take them, take them in the hotel with you. Some actually have a little, a little, uh, a, a little piece of fabric that you can throw into the door and you close the door and you can just, you can start to do your rows there. And when we're talking about rows, we're talking, and I'm not trying to be condescending. I know a lot of people go to gyms and have certain things in their home, but I just want to be clear to people that folks can do simple sort of things to really activate muscles that they don't use every day and keep from injuring themselves in a way they tear something and wind up having to have surgery or become inactive again. And you're talking about something as simple as rows where they can get a piece of tubing, which you can get for 10, 15, 20 bucks or something that you can put around a pole or whatever. And it's got handles on it. And you can do chest rows, waist rows. You pull just like you're rowing a boat. Right. And that activates the muscles in your back. Absolutely. And you can also use that same, that same because they, they typically come with handles. So you can do external rotation and internal rotation, which are your rotator cuff muscles, right? So, yeah. so now you're getting the rotator cuff. You're doing a little rowing. Um, if I were to tell people to go on, like uh, on YouTube, you can find a million videos, but Ys, Ts, reverse flies, all these muscles target the back. Um, and are exceptional to to decrease the neck stress, to increase uh, the strength of the of the back in general, and to support the shoulder. Yeah, and Pat, I'm a big fan, obviously, of chiropractic. And a lot of people might think about this from a generation ago, but modern chiropractic is a lot different than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. You're a big believer in people strengthening their core because you see a lot of back injuries, a lot of back aches, a lot of neck problems and stuff. And what we're talking about keeps people from having those kind of problems. Correct. Right now, we have an incredible amount of scientific evidence to show the benefit of keeping the body as possibly aligned as possible, keeping the flexibility in the body and then the strengthening. When you combine flexibility with strength, it's, it's more difficult to be injured the body can then be attuned to perform at an optimum level. Now, we've got the average person, like you say, are they a couch potato or are they you know, an Olympic athlete? So where in the spectrum does that individual fall? Uh, we can be great bodybuilders or great weightlifters, and we can go swim 10 laps in a 40-foot you know, long pool, and our, our body's sore as heck for the next two or three days because they're muscles we don't normally use. So what I have found is that at what do you want to perform and is there a little bit of conditioning you can do, five, seven-minute warm-up before you play that activity? We're talking in particular about pickleball. So what, as Dave was saying, is what are some exercises we can do to strengthen and also to increase flexibility for that arm? We don't normally perform an arm length strain in, in everyday life. So when we're going to do that activity and we put pivot with rotation, you're going to be more prone to injury. If there's some basic exercises, as Dave said, you know, wise tees and something on YouTube you can look at and or simple basic exercise you do daily, you have now activated those muscles. They have the memory within them. So when you go to perform that activity, such as the pickleball, it's not so strenuous on that arm, not so strenuous on the shoulder or that joint. Less prone to injury. Yeah. And that's the thing. When we do some of these sports activities, and a lot of people are listening to us right now while they're walking. You know, they're going out for their morning walk. They've got their earbuds in. They've hit podcasts, fill in the blanks, and they're playing while they're walking. Walking is something we do every day. It's an activity of daily living. So that's not an issue. But when they go to play a sport, whether it be softball or tennis or pickleball or golf or whatever, 
you're doing rotations and things. They're not activities of daily living. So we're doing rotations and extensions and things that we don't do every day, and our body is not accustomed to it. Our tendons and our ligaments and our muscles and stuff, we're asking the body to do things it doesn't do every day. And that's where we've got to start doing range of motion, strength and stuff, so we don't wind up injuring ourselves. Exactly. You don't have to be an athlete to exercise. You don't have to be an athlete to get your body in the best shape that it can be. A lot of people are athletes, and you'll go to the track down at the high school, and you'll see somebody there that ran track at some college or something, and he or she's whipping around the track and stuff. And I'm going like, yeah, let me tell you, you ever see me running through the neighborhood shoot whoever is directly behind me because I'm not jogging. I'm escaping. Somebody's chasing me. I hate jogging. I expend more energy doing something I enjoy like playing tennis. I would never do that on a treadmill. I would never do it on the street. My knees wouldn't let me do that. But on a tennis court, I'll put out the energy, the effort, because I enjoy doing it. I enjoy the camaraderie. The guys that I'm hanging with, I enjoy the competition. I enjoy trying to perfect the strokes and hitting the ball, that sort of thing. But the repetition of just getting on the road and running down the road, it's like, oh, God, kill me now. I wouldn't do it. Some studies say only 8% of people keep their resolutions by the middle of February. Hmm. And the way to overcome that is set your environment up to support your goals. So. Maybe it's as simple as when you get to work, park in the far end of the parking lot so you build in that walk back and forth. Maybe you keep a couple of pound weights in the floorboard of your car so you carry those on the way and you change shoes when you get in there. You wear sneakers so you can walk. Set your environment up to support what you want to do. And if you'll figure a way that it's easy, instead of hard, then you can do it. I said last week, you can walk in right now to my desk in the house and there's a pair of 15 pound dumbbells sitting on my desk. Because while I'm reading something, I'll get a set of curls in, I'll get a set of triceps in or something while I'm reading. I may not have time to go up to the gym, but throughout the day, I'll get in eight sets of Flies or shoulder yeah, raises that's, or... That's like Pat's saying. He's talking about the consistency of it. Uh-huh. I think the important thing is people that do consider joining gyms, make sure the gym is easily accessible. You know, there's been plenty of plenty of research that says the farther the gym is away from you, the less likely you're going to be able to get there. Um, uh, the second thing I would say is to set realistic expectations. Don't expect change overnight. It's a process. And, and, and this is what Pat's talking about, the consistency of it and what you're saying, the consistency of it will, will, will pay off in dividends in time. Um, uh, nutritionally, right? If you make certain, uh, uh, certain nutritional changes, for example, that six days out of the week, you eat really well, right? You have your proteins, you have your, your, your vegetables, a little fruits. Um, and on one day a week, you just let yourself binge, that one day, a cheat day, a cheat meal, right? That will make all the difference in the world. Because you know, I got that, that cheat day is coming up on Saturday. I'm going to stay tight to Saturday. And the more you do that, the more it reinforces the positive behavior, the better success you're going to have. Then you start to see the actual changes where you, you've got increased lean body mass, your body fat's coming down. Pat's talking about the alertness, right? Um, uh, and, the, and the energy just generally increases. And and the last thing I would say is make sure you're drinking plenty of water. Most of us don't drink nearly enough water. And and, and oftentimes just drinking water makes people more alert and and more energetic. And and the key to the drinking water, because I've, well, you know, I go ahead, just fill it up, put it at your desk where you work, whatever it is, where you are, we're spending most of your time and leave there. Well, I don't like to taste the water. Okay. How about some herbal tea, you know, peach flavored tea, or put some lemon in it, or can you make something that you're drinking the water and you're changing the flavor a bit. You know, it doesn't have to be um, carbonated. You can get non-sugar drinks, but then suddenly they have other chemicals that aren't good for your body. But the key is a, is a consistency, consistency, and you could be doing your exercise and you're finding there's no changes in your body whatsoever. Suddenly stick with it three weeks, four weeks, or six weeks, and almost in one week you're like, how did I just lose three pounds? Boy, I'm feeling better because initially the body's sensing stress. 
it's it's hold, it's holding the weight. It's holding the toxins in because it doesn't want to release that. It's sensing stress. As it says, oh, wow, this is good for me and it's not overexertion. Now it can say, I can eliminate the toxins within my body. So that's why some people don't stick with it. And the others, I said, as Dave said, the gym, how far it is, what's your time commitment? Have your plan, Huge. work your plan. It's got to be, that's why I start people don't do any more than 15 to 20 minutes, maximum 25. Well, yeah, how many times you see it though? You, 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 people get to the gym, right? And then they know a bunch of people there and they, they talk half the time, right? So, so what I would say is have, have in your mind what you want to accomplish that day and how long you're going to be there. Right. And, 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 and stay away from the cell phone other than just give yourself some music because you know, usually when it's, when it's happening is they're distracted by texts and they're texting all at the whole session and pretty soon the time's gone and I've accomplished nothing. So I think just, just having an idea what you want to accomplish that day, I'm going to be in there 35, 40 minutes, like Pat's saying, as you get in better shape, you'll be there a little longer. Might and, be there and, an hour, yeah. hour and 15. And for some people, you yeah. know, going to the gym is a social environment. They see all their friends. That's, that's their community. And that's, uh, that's something different, you know, than we're talking about. But that's also healthy too, because you have your community where you're associated with other people. So let's say they work till five, they get to the gym at six, they're there till 8.30. That's their lifestyle. That's what they love. That's great for them. That's not work, you know, but then we say someone does nothing versus the Olympic athlete. Where does one person fall? And is it doable, sustainable right. and enjoyable? Sure. And are you feeling good about yourself? Mm -hmm. That's key. Yeah, if there was one thing that I would point to it's getting an attitude that you're in control. Nobody's making you do this. I'm going to be who I am on purpose. I'm going to decide what I'm going to do. If you own it, if you own the plan, then there's nothing to rebel against. Like you say, you got a cheat day coming up or whatever. If you own the plan, who are you rebelling against? There's nobody to fight back against. All I'm saying is I want people to say, all right, look, if I've made this resolution, if I'm going to get more active or whatever, I just want to do it in a way that I'm not going to hurt myself. I'm not going to injure myself because A, that makes you inactive again. And it's real hard to get started once you get inert. How do you get an elephant up once it lays down? You don't. It's real hard. So I want people to go at this in a way that they're able to succeed. Like I say, we talked about pickleball kind of sweeping the nation right now. My good friend in Dallas, Tom Dundon, just purchased professional pickleball leagues. And I introduced him to my other good friend, Ken Solomon, who runs Tennis Channel and brought them together so they can start televising all of this kind of stuff. I'm a big fan of it. But if people will just go through a few of the things you guys are talking about, then they can enjoy it and not wind up hurting themselves. And then so they went, well, I can't do that. I injure myself. I do it. No, you injure yourself if you don't do it right. You just got to do some things where you ease into it. And because it's fun, you don't have to go play eight hours on Saturday, ease into it and go about it and decide what's my philosophy going to be. It's different things for different folks. I made a decision some time ago with regard to food control. I just made the decision that if I sit down to eat something and it's not really good, I just don't eat it. I made that decision. Like, if something's really good, I'll eat it. If it's not good, I used to just sit down and I would eat some just because it was there. And then I made a decision if this isn't really good, I ain't eating it. <laughs> and I just push, no thanks. I take two bites. This is not really good. I'm not gonna eat. I can't tell you what a difference that's made. Just deciding I'm only going to eat if it's really, really good. So where's the difference for you? What's it been not, when you say it's made a difference, so you're not consuming calories that you didn't want in right. your body? Yeah, I'm of. not wasting them on something that's not really yeah. good. Okay. So I go get something that's dry or it's like tougher than a boot. I just don't eat it. No, thanks. I'm good. Okay. I'm good. So do you put something in its place or is just, you know exactly what you like and that's your, that's yeah, your diet? I just kind of, well, yeah, I'll, I'll get it next time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. okay. Cause half the time I'm really not all that hungry. So I'll eat a little bit and then move on. It doesn't take much surprisingly. So I stopped eating things I don't really want. It was a very simple switch to flip and it's made a huge difference. So what's your personal switch? 
it's the same thing about this exercise and getting active. Do it, just do it right, and set your environment up to support it. You know, you know, uh, I keep this keeps coming to my uh, into my head as you're talking. I'm sure Pat will back this up, but because of the COVID pandemic, um, the number of patients I had coming in with neck and back problems from sitting computers all day long, television, you know. Did you see an increase in, in neck and low back? Yeah, neck? I, I'd, I'd see the ones that were coming in pre-COVID, they came in with a different condition. <laughs> and the ones that uh, were, you know, like had back problems come in now, neck problems, they're more at the computer. They're going, why, why are you having neck problems? Because you weren't having this before. You worked at a computer from work. Well, I'm on my bed and it's a flip top and I go in different positions and I'm looking down. Okay, well, we That's have to set up though. your ergonomics. You have yeah. to set the proper table. Well, I'm at my dining room table or kitchen table and the chair is not really that good and it's too high or too low. And so the, the, the dynamics, the biomechanics are ergonomics are poor. So you have to set up that station. And I just like what you're saying that. And it just, it's the safety and you got to do what you like. But, but, but the other thing about that though, is during the pandemic, a lot of people were less active. Some yes. people took it the opposite direction. Also a great chance to go hiking and get That was for stuff, me. Right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. But, but, but I, I think the majority of the people were fearful to go out. So they became less active, which to your point, become active. Go for a walk, yeah. like you're saying. I think walking totally. is one of the greatest, easiest things anyone can do. Now, when it's cold outside, okay, up in the north, winter time, how am I going to go outside? It's cold. Well, once again, you can go to go to the internet, and you can do certain activities, whether it's a yoga class or something for 15, 20 minutes. You know, uh, activities that you can do that are still very, very healthy for you, and enjoyable. Set it. When are you going to do it? In the morning, afternoon, evening. You have children. What's the, what's the plan? Take care of yourself is all I'm saying. As we go into this, I wanted to hear from you guys. I love what y'all are saying about getting functionally ready for what you're doing and not blowing yourself out as you get into these activities. We're in wintertime now, but we're going to be through this in no time and getting back out there. And now is a good time. If you're up in the Northeast or even in the Northwest right now and you've got cabin fever, great time to start building your core. Great time to start doing some of these functional exercises to get yourself ready to get out. And for God's sakes, don't have a heart attack shoveling snow. That's an intensity that we're just not ready for. You know, in the sports medicine world, there's what's called specificity of training. So if I'm going to do a certain movement playing tennis, basketball, what have you, you want to try and incorporate activities that are going to lean toward improving that skill set. The second thing that I see is, is uh, you have to take in mind adaptation. And I can't tell you the number of patients, I'm sure you can agree with this, um, that come in and, and they're doing the same routine, the same number of sets, the same weights for years, right? So at that point, your body's not going to adapt. So if you're going to slowly increase your walking time, you have to slowly increase the time. You can't keep it at 15 minutes and expect that to improve unless you add hills to it or you add increased cadence or walking faster. Um, and you have, to, you, have to, you have to have goals in mind of how you're going to progress that activity. And that's really key. And listen to your body. If something's hurting you, don't do the same thing the next day. Give yourself a day off. Rest. Yeah. Go brave. Yeah. Do something different. The key, once again, it's, it's, it's what you think, what you eat, and what you do. You've got to have body movement, okay, at, at, at any age. As much, and you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to inflame the areas. What you're eating, as you said, if you don't like it, you don't eat it. Is there portion control? And then what you're thinking, if you're having a plan and you're in control, you said, Phil, of your life, and you are the master of how you're going to do it. Now you're doing it, and is it enjoyable? It's sustainable. It's sustainable, and it's effective, and you feel better about yourself. Now, as you're doing those things, and as Dave said, you change activities, you add times, you change, and you can modify what you're doing specifically to that activity that you're doing. If I want to swim a lot, all right, what are swimming exercises I can do? Here's you look them up on the internet, look over to the YouTube, whatever you can do to help increase your strength and flexibility so you can form that activity to a higher level, and then you'll feel a greater form of accomplishment for yourself. Well, you guys live what you preach. I got to say, we've been working together for 20 years. I've watched you guys practice what you preach. You take care of yourselves and me, so I'm glad. 